My name is Greg Ingram. I'm president of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this, the sixth annual land policy conference sponsored by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. The themes of these conferences over the years have alternated between local public finance topics and more general land policy topics. Uh, this year's theme on land value capture falls more or less clearly within the realm of local public finance, but it really also affects other issues, has repercussions for land development and even for urban form. Uh, along with a copy of the conference papers, which many of you, I'm happy to say, asked to get on a memory stick instead of in hard copy, which uh, s saves a lot of paper, uh, uh, along with that, you also have at your seats a copy of the volume from last year's conference, which was on climate change. Uh, the, uh, that volume addresses many of the linkages between land policy and climate change, ranging from the implications of climate change and sea level rise for coastal areas and coastal cities to the capacity that's required for the governance of this global public good or global public bad, depending on how you look at it. Both last year's conference and the conference the year before, which dealt with the municipal finance, new sources of revenue for municipalities, uh, are relevant to today's conference because value capture certainly has the potential for being a source of revenue for local municipalities. Uh, and it's also the case that with respect to climate change, a lot of the investments that are going to be involved in climate change are going to have tremendous impacts on land values. And so value capture begins to be a candidate mechanism for financing some of the investments uh, that are going to be associated with climate change. Incidentally, uh, for those of you who are writing these papers and discussing them and preparing remarks, we aim every year to produce the volume 11 months after the conference, and we've done that for the last five years. And so this, and here is physical evidence <laughs> that we do that. Uh, so I just want you all to prepare yourself uh, to be responsive to our, our deadlines as we proceed. And I also want to note, this is not the last time you'll hear this uh, f from us, but I wanted to, to get you used to a sort of recurrent message. Uh, as we have proceeded with the organization of this conference, I've been gratified the topic has proven to be very timely. And I've asked myself, what accounts for its timeliness? It turns out, for example, in the last week or so, we've had several people call us who've learned about the conference, say, we're working on this, we'd really like to attend the conference. This is not something that happens to us every year, and, it's, and this is a rather obscure and specialized topic, and so I've been, been thinking about why is it that this has proven to be such a timely topic. Well, one reason is, of course, the local fiscal crisis goes on. Value capture is a source of municipal revenue, and if you're just seeking new sources of general funds, this is another candidate that you will want to look at. In part, it's also related to the need for infrastructure investment funds in the United States because value capture is particularly associated with infrastructure investments which improve land values. And a lot of the practices in the world have to do with various kinds of infrastructure investments ranging from sidewalks and streetlights to larger uh, municipal investments. The third reason, I think, is it's, it's in part, it's in the air. It's been popularized by books and recent articles, many of which draw on experience from other countries, international experience with value capture, much more than in the United States. And then, of course, the fourth reason is there are a number of ongoing practices, disparate practices, practices like tax increment financing and so on and so forth, which are actually forms of value capture. And value capture has emerged as a kind of umbrella over a set of practices uh, that are, actually have some familiarity uh, uh, to many of us here in the room. So we've, we've tried to design a program uh, that will reveal and explain many of the complexities of, of value capture. Some of the issues and points we're looking at, for example, are first the issue of symmetry. And that is if governments seek payment by landowners for increases in the value of their land caused by public actions, should governments also compensate landowners for public actions that reduce the value of their land? This is the issue of partial givings and partial takings, 
that you read about in the literature. The second issue is, gee, are we already doing it? Are we like uh, Monsieur Jourdain in Moliere's novel that, who learned he'd been speaking prose for 40 years and hadn't realized it, are we actually already engaging in a lot of value capture? And here we look at traditional instruments like property taxation, for example, and, and look at the extent to which existing instruments either embody value capture or can be made to embody value capture to a larger extent. Third, drawing on international experience, we look at experience with betterment levies in Britain and France. We look at transit system value capture schemes in Tokyo and Hong Kong, and at airport improvement fees in several countries. In addition, uh, we also examine land pooling arrangements uh, using an example from Gujarat, India. A lot of land pooling has been done, sometimes called land reorganization, has been done in Asia. So this, uh, we have one example there. And finally, we look at governments as landowners and nonprofits as landowners and discuss the extent to which uh, value capture can be used uh, f for those owners as well. And there we're looking at the management of U.S. lands, you know, U.S. government-owned lands in the West and also at uh, nonprofit entities. So turning back now to the simple theory of land value capture, economists often find it and other taxes on land to be efficient and particularly to be relatively non-distorting, relatively, that is, relative to other taxes. That essentially any time you place a tax on a good, you change its relative price, and that can distort the extent to which it's used, and land taxes have the the uh, characteristic that they distort prices minimally and therefore uh, don't change uh, economic outcomes very much. Our keynote speaker today is going to mention this in passing, at least she, meant it, she mentions it in passing in her paper, uh, but her, she's addressing this morning not so much the links between value capture and efficiency, but the links between value capture and justice. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Susan Feinstein, our keynote speaker today. She's a professor of urban planning at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And before that, uh, before she came to Harvard, she was at Columbia and also taught at Rutgers University. She received the Distinguished Educator Award from the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. Uh, she has, her work has focused on comparative urban public policy urban political economy, public participation, urban redevelopment, and planning theory. And her most recent book, The Just City, was published uh, last summer. Uh, and at the end of her remarks this morning, we'll have an opportunity for some questions and answers. Uh, we, we do not have a discussion for keynote addresses. We have discussions for the rest of the day, but uh, she is just going to have to uh, respond to questions uh, uh, at the end of her remarks. So please uh, welcome me, uh, please join me this morning in welcoming Professor Feinstein. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, frankly, I was a little surprised to be asked. I thought you had to be an economist uh, to speak to this august gathering. Uh, I want to um, address, I'm told if I click on this it'll work. There we go. Uh, I want to address, as Greg already told you, uh, the question of equity in relationship to capturing the value of increase, uh, capturing increases in the value of land. I want to start out start out with a quote from Henry George. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, the Lincoln Land Institute uh, was founded uh, on the premise that uh, Henry George's ideas uh, could be expounded, could be um, researched. Uh, and the endowment here, I think, was for that purpose. Uh, so I have this quote, which I think captures uh, George's intention. And I'm going to actually read it. Uh, the widespreading social evils which everywhere oppress men amid an advancing civilization spring from a great primary wrong, the appropriation as the exclusive property of some men 
of the land on which and from which all must live. From this fundamental injustice flow all the injustices which distort and endanger modern development, which condemn the pro producer of wealth to poverty and pamper the non-producers in luxury, which rear, the, which rear the tenement house with the palace, uh, plant the brothel behind the church, and compel us to build prisons as we open new schools. Uh, well, George's fundamental idea was that uh, this was an injustice. Not that it was an inefficiency, but that it was an injustice. Uh, not that prices could be distorted, to use the term that uh, Greg used, but rather that uh, uh, land was simply a good, a public good, uh, which should benefit the public. Uh, and I think it's important to bear in mind that this was his concern, that equity was his concern, uh, not, um, not simply efficiency, although he did have efficiency concerns as well. Uh, now, in the book that I uh, published last summer, The Just City, I attempt to provide a philosophical framework for what I call urban justice. I use uh, the works of well-known philosophers to provide uh, this rather abstract framework. Uh, the most famous, I suppose, is John Rawls, a Harvard professor whose work uh, has been much, uh, well, there's a whole industry uh, in the development of Rawls's um, argument. Uh, and the reason that Rawls has had such a profound effect on thought in the last century uh, is because he attempted to establish justice uh, as a primary value based not on sentiment, based not on um, natural law, not based on God, uh, but rather uh, within the framework, in fact, of contemporary economic thought. Uh, so Rawls's difference principle uh, is one that says that uh, if we all were behind a veil of ignorance, didn't know where that is in what he calls the original position, didn't know where we'd end up uh, once society developed, uh, that uh, we would choose a society of relative equality because otherwise the odds were we'd be more likely to be at the bottom than the top. So it would be only rational uh, to have an equitable society. Uh, so rather than resorting to simply morality or our sense of justice, uh, he said justice is logical. Uh, the philosopher who's become most popular among urban theorists uh, for some time is Henri Lefebvre, a French thinker whose thought I've always found rather difficult and opaque. Uh, but this term that he has, the right to the city, uh, is one that uh, has been used very widely, has been even the basis for mobilizing a political movement. What's important about it from the perspective of uh, urban policy is that he, in fact, broadens the discourse beyond simply equity and distribution, uh, but rather uh, talks about the way in which people participate in the making of the city, uh, a sense, in fact, of ownership of the city by all the people uh, who belong to it, uh, that uh, people, in fact, uh, who are urban citizens, or to use a phrase of Guido Martinati, who are urban users, uh, should have the power to partake, to create the city and to partake in the enjoyment of urban life. Uh, in other words, that um, they should have access to all parts of the city, but more the right to the city doesn't just mean access, it also means participation in many different senses, not simply participation in planning or participation in uh, uh, decisions of the city council, but actually participation in the making of the city in everyday life. Uh, now, the argument that I make in my paper is that it's only in public ownership of land can, that the equity ambition of Henry George can be fully realized. Uh, although there are various methods of capturing or recapturing value increases in land, uh, if it's under private ownership, uh, it can only be partial, even if the public has created this increase in value. And then, uh, to have equity consequences, this can only occur under certain additional conditions. 
uh, that simply uh, the public receiving the return on land uh, is no guarantee that that return will be used to promote equity. Uh, in fact, often it is used, especially in TIF situations, for re quite the opposite. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the political obstacles to public ownership, especially within the United States, but interestingly not uh, in other capitalist countries necessarily, uh, the political obstacles to it uh, mean that this ideal solution will rarely be reached. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about some of the political issues that have arisen around attempts to um, produce a public return. Now, uh, economists, for economists, efficiency tends to be the holy grail. Uh, and uh, one of the things I was interested in uh, in an earlier volume published by Lincoln Land is the extent to which efficiency became the criterion uh, for examining uh, value capture. Uh, now, I have another quote first from Henry George, in which he himself also uh, talks about the way in which confiscatory taxation of land uh, value uh, does in fact produce efficiency. He says, treating land as private property stands in the way of its proper use. Were land treated as public property, it would be used and improved as soon as there was a need for the use, for its use or improvement. But being treated as private property, the individual owner is permitted to prevent others from using or improving what he cannot or will not use or improve himself. Uh, well, we, of course, especially in the United States, are familiar with the checkerboard pattern of sprawl, uh, where land adjacent to uh, developed property is not developed. Uh, this seems an inefficient use of land. Uh, however, uh, we don't necessarily want to develop land. Uh, we have, in fact, all kinds of other ways of preventing development from agricultural, uh, from taxing agricultural uses less, uh, to providing uh, conservation districts of various kinds. Uh, fully developed land uh, is not necessarily what we want. The use of green belts, uh, for example, or the green heart in the Netherlands are all statements that uh, even though this would be from a purely economic point of view, a logical place for expansion, uh, that we don't want it. Uh, so the argument that says that uh, we have to always move on uh, and develop to produce the highest and best use is one that even in um, popular discourse is one that we don't really fully accept. Now, uh, I referred uh, before to the, a previous um, conference here in which Diane England uh, look at uh, the impact, uh, the economic impact of land value capture. Uh, and what's interesting about their article, I don't mean to stereotype economists, but perhaps I do, uh, is that they begin by citing George's concern with social inequality. That's the opening paragraph. And then immediately move on to talk about whether or not a high land tax is efficient or not. And in fact, the whole article is about uh, efficiency, quote, in the light of modern economic theory. Uh, they then show that uh, a land tax is an efficient tax. Uh, well, is this really why uh, we should be concerned with land value capture uh, in terms of whether or not it's efficient? Uh, because efficiency uh, in this respect is defined in rather narrow terms. Uh, the question of efficient for what uh, becomes, well, efficient in terms of keeping uh, markets working properly, keeping the prices right. Uh, so um, from an efficiency perspective, highest and best use is always desirable. Uh, well, why is it desirable? Uh, presumably then uh, the public will receive the most possible taxation. Uh, and uh, the effect of development will trickle down to um, all of the members of the public. Uh, but we know well that trickle down doesn't always work. Uh, and moreover, uh, there's a circularity to defining efficiency uh, in market terms uh, because efficiency is defined by the market. So since uh, we say that 
uh, what's efficient is that which makes the market work best, and it's best for the market to work best because that's efficient. We're never really getting out of this kind of circularity. Uh, if instead uh, we said that, well, what we're really concerned with is equity uh, in the distribution of space and the allocation of space, rather than maximum development, uh, then our criterion shifts from being efficiency to being, in fact, Lefebvre's uh, criterion of the right to the city. And the right to the city uh, is not a right that's defined in terms of efficiency, although efficiency may, in fact, uh, at times, uh, enhance that, uh, that right. Uh, now, uh, there are further problems with the concept of private ownership and, uh, and confiscatory taxation of increases in land value. Uh, if land is held freehold, uh, then how you really figure out the value of the land as compared to the value of the structures on the land is, is a very complex problem. Uh, there's a little footnote in the Die in England uh, chapter uh, which says, well, they were going to do this in South African cities, and then they just threw up their hands and gave up. Uh, because it's uh, when you have buildings that have been sitting on land for decades, how do you, in fact, figure out the value of the land as compared to the value of the buildings, which may have had investment put in them or may have had disinvestment, or how do you net out uh, the structure value? And then even if you don't have structures on land, that is, even if the land isn't developed, uh, that uh, uh, you uh, are looking at undeveloped land, but each piece of undeveloped land has certain unique uh, characteristics. Uh, and um, as I said earlier, you may not, in fact, really wish to develop land that's contiguous to build up areas. You might want to preserve it uh, as open space. Uh, but the biggest problem really is that of gentrification and displacement, because highest and best use always means that, well, if some poor people are living on the land, and uh, as uh, Justice O'Connor said, or you know, if it was a Motel 6 and you replaced it with a Ritz, that would be the highest and best use. But we might want Motel 6s. Uh, we might want what um, planners like to call marginal businesses. Uh, one of the issues of marginal businesses, uh, which tend to occupy uh, somewhat shabby structures and may be on the fringes of downtown, uh, is that they employ a lot of people. Uh, that uh, the people they employ may be people with relatively low skills. Uh, so uh, we can uh, displace marginal businesses and replace them with uh, businesses that are much more profitable and which uh, are in much fancier buildings, uh, but the equity impacts of that might be uh, quite, uh, quite poor. Uh, at breakfast uh, today, uh, Alex Van Hoffman and I were talking about um, uh, the fact that New York uh, so in its planning policy emphasizes the financial industry at the expense of manufacturing. Uh, and currently, of course, uh, you may be all familiar with the effort that the city is doing to uh, uh, reconstruct uh, Willits Point in Queens. Uh, well, Willits Point uh, certainly looks horrible, and it looks horrible in part because the city has failed to invest in sewers, in roads, or in any kind of uh, upgrading of the area. It's occupied by uh, body shops and uh, junkyards and uh, low-end uh, food manufacturing, or ethnic food manufacturing. Uh, but it employs a lot of people. These are, in fact, viable businesses as long as the rent isn't high. Uh, but once the rent becomes high, they're no longer viable. And it's no, there's no place that they're really going to go, uh, or certainly not in New York City. Uh, when um, uh, the city, uh, when London uh, took over the land, or the UK took over the land where the Olympics uh, are going to go, they displaced something over 600 small businesses. And again, it, they're sort of brushed away, well, these are marginal businesses. These aren't the ones that bring in a, a lot of value and a lot of export income. Uh, but if you're looking at the question of employment and who works for them, uh, you have, in fact, a different uh, outlook. Uh, then, of course, there's the issue not just of business gentrification, but of residential gentrification. Uh, so that uh, highest and best use thus means that Long Island City and Queens or uh, the South Boston waterfront or uh, the area around the Olympic 
Park in London, uh, that these areas then we'll have upscale condos. Uh, well, upscale condos uh, certainly, again, uh, are bringing more revenue, uh, but they don't provide places for low-income people to live. And so the argument for economic efficiency usually means uh, gentrification and displacement uh, because of what Neil Smith has labeled the rent gap. Uh, in suburban areas, there's a recent um, doctoral dissertation that uh, was done at Harvard uh, by Suzanne Charles uh, on uh, suburban gentrification, uh, in which she specifically looked at teardowns. Well, teardowns exactly show the rent gap. They show the difference between the value that you could get from a piece of land and the value that's actually being gotten. Uh, but of course, um, by raising the efficiency of use of the land, if you consider a large McMansion to be efficient in any other sense but revenue, uh, by raising the efficiency, you are, of course, removing that piece of land from the low income, or the lower, I should say, income pool. Uh, now, I'm not going to talk about um, uh, the British experience, because Phil Booth is going to do so later, uh, but simply to mention it, uh, that the Labor government in Britain since uh, the 1909 uh, until um, 1975 uh, sought to capture land values, uh, increases in land values. So every time labor came in, uh, they would pass legislation that uh, attempted to do this, and then every time they went out and the conservatives came in, they got rid of the legislation. By and large, uh, landowners were able to wait out uh, these periods when it looked like the values would be taken by the government. And Britain, uh, new labor, of course, has given up on this altogether. Uh, but I think the efforts by labor showed the extent to which it was widely recognized uh, that um, uh, there was an inequity involved uh, in private owners capturing uh, increases in value of land. Uh, Amsterdam and Singapore are the two uh, cities that I want to focus on. Uh, which are both cities where the government owns almost all the land and development within them is in accordance with the plan. Now, neither Amsterdam nor Singapore would be characterized as non-capitalist, uh, although you might want to call them, certainly the Republicans in the United States would call Amsterdam socialist. Uh, and uh, Singapore is a kind of oddity. It's a hybrid. It's very hard uh, to characterize it very clearly because the government owns almost everything. It owns 60 percent of the economy. On the other hand, it is extremely competitive uh, and uh, it depends entirely on export income. Uh, it um, uh, is strongly capitalist in the sense that it gives every possible subsidy to foreign businesses and to foreign workers if they're up, you know, highly educated. Uh, construction is carried out by both public and private developers. Uh, what's also anomalous is that although housing is all public, almost all public housing, 80% uh, of, more than 80% of the housing stock is public housing in the sense that the Housing Development Board, the government built it, uh, on the other hand, uh, everybody owns their own apartment uh, and can resell it on the private market. Uh, so um, what's key about Singapore, however, is public sector ownership of land. Uh, in Amsterdam, likewise, uh, there's public ownership of land, uh, but there is much more extensive private development than is the case in Singapore. Uh, and I'll, well, I'll go into this more. And then New York, uh, there are examples within New York of public ownership of the land and leasehold. Uh, so I want to talk about some of these various methods. When am I supposed to? Okay, good. Okay, so other approaches which Greg mentioned are community land trust, linkage payments, uh, tax increments, um, profit sharing arrangements and community benefits agreements, and I'll either talk about them or not, depending on how I'm doing for time. Uh, but I want to focus for a bit on Amsterdam and then on Singapore. 
Uh, so in Amsterdam, uh, the uh, municipality of Amsterdam owns about 90% of the land within the borders of the city. Uh, it acquired the land uh, over a period of time under a leasehold system. Uh, I didn't really realize until I started doing the research for this paper that Henry George was in fact an important figure uh, in turn of the 20th century Amsterdam, that the land purchase policy was very influenced by uh, the thought of Henry George. Uh, they acquired the land initially uh, simply on the open market and then after legislation at the beginning of the 20th century uh, at quite low prices uh, using um, compulsory purchase. Uh, now what they did once they acquired the land, and the only part of the city of Amsterdam that's privately, still privately owned is the very historic center uh, where uh, the so-called monument houses are on the old canals, uh, that um, they then pooled all the land so that there wasn't a particular area where you'd say this land was more valuable than that land. Uh, because what they did was they eliminated the price differential that location uh, caused. Uh, so by essentially cross-subsidizing all the land in Amsterdam, then it became possible to build social housing in the center, or approximate, approximate to the old center, and all around. And what the result is, is that when you are in Amsterdam, you don't really, you can't say, oh, I'm in a bad neighborhood or I'm in a good neighborhood. Uh, that uh, it isn't that it all looks alike, in fact, parts of it look quite different, uh, but that there isn't a place where you say, oh, well, this is all the upper class, or this is all the lower class, because social housing uh, is, in fact, uh, scattered all about. Uh, then uh, they charge a land rent uh, to developers, uh, including uh, nonprofit developers. That is, if the housing association uh, is building on the land, they also are charged a land rent. Uh, but uh, they charge very low land rents for social accommodation. That is for social housing, for hospitals, for cultural facilities, and so forth. And they charge a high land rent to private uh, developers. Uh, the lease is typically for from 50 to 99 years. And one of the issues then becomes that, in fact, the price isn't adjusted until the lease comes up for renegotiation. Uh, now. Um, for profitable ventures, uh, the rent is calculated, really um, it's bargained out. And so the final price is determined through uh, negotiation. Uh, but uh, the municipality, based on the projection of what, how much money the uh, development's going to make, uh, gets a, a higher rent uh, than for places where um, they don't expect much profitability. Uh, so what does this mean in terms of Amsterdam? Uh, as I already said, there's little differentiation between the good and bad parts of the city, and social housing is everywhere. Uh, studies that have been done by Sacco Mustard and his associates uh, have uh, looked at the extent of income segregation, uh, spatial income segregation in the city, and have found uh, substantial heterogeneity. Even in the grandest neighborhoods, in the old canal district, uh, what you find are some houses that were squatted uh, that then were turned over to the squatters. You find houseboats that are moored in the very best canals. Uh, so that there, and you find a tolerance by people of living with others who are different and who have, if you're talking about upper class people, living adjacent to people who have quite lower class uh, incomes. Uh, there is more ethnic segregation uh, in Amsterdam than income segregation although it's nothing to the extreme of the United States. Uh, but um, it's a consequence really of, in certain ways, historical accident of when different waves of migration came to Amsterdam, uh, which then um, uh, the new wave would move into the newest vacant social housing uh, so that the Bommermeer, which is a large public housing project on the uh, edge of the city uh, has a very large Surinamese population. Uh, the post-war social housing uh, has a large Turkish and Moroccan population. Uh, so the, but even there, uh, you see uh, a lot of native Dutch. And even in the Bommermeer, you see a lot of native Dutch. Uh, 
uh, along with um, uh, pooling of the land, because the public owned the land, there was no great difficulty in putting in infrastructure. Uh, and public transit is widely uh, accessible and makes all parts of the city available to people. Uh, there are no slums in Amsterdam. There's ample public space. There's a very active city civic culture, uh, which contrasts with my other example of Singapore, uh, which provides a lot to its citizens but uh, does not have a civic culture of much size. Uh, Amsterdam does not have land speculation. Uh, I, uh, when the first time I was there, I inquired of uh, Andreas Faludi why he thought it was that developers were willing to accept this system and to build housing only where the city led it and then to only get really a, a very predictable return. They could never make a speculative gain. And he said, well, you know, they may never make a speculative gain, but they always make a gain. They always know there's no risk. Uh, they have simply a secure flow of income from their property. Uh, so here you'll see a picture. This is a so-called Western Garden suburb building. Uh, it was built uh, in the period um, of the 1950s. Uh, this is an unrenovated building, and they are now um, uh, renovating the whole area uh, and uh, closing in the balconies to give people more space. Uh, people, given the climate of Amsterdam, don't use the balconies that much. Uh, so uh, it represents the kind of housing that um, uh, there's a very heavy Turkish and Moroccan population that lives there. Now, the renovation of the area is um, taking a fair amount of the buildings of the rentals out of the public sector. And what we're seeing now in Amsterdam is a move away from social housing towards private ownership. Uh, so some of these buildings are being torn down. Uh, people are simply given rent subsidies. Uh, others of them are, in fact, renovated for the people who live there. Uh, and um, the new construction uh, is something like one-third uh, public, or one-third social housing, one-third private, and one-third uh, moderate. Uh, so uh, what you see now in Amsterdam is that the leasehold system is being retained, uh, but there's a large reduction in the commitment to social housing. Uh, thus, the market is setting prices to an extent that was not uh, the case uh, in the past. Uh, the result is that gentrification is now occurring, particularly in the neighborhoods that have more interesting architecture, like the Jordan. Uh, and uh, even though the public receives the increases in value as a consequence of the leasehold system. Uh, it goes to the public in general, to the general fund, rather than uh, as a method of producing greater equity. Uh, I was having dinner, I was at a dinner party uh, at someone's house, uh, and the person I was sitting next to, I only found out afterwards, was the director of planning uh, for the municipality. Uh, so I happened to mention that I had that morning interviewed somebody in the development corporation uh, who had said that, well, uh, we're now moving towards private ownership, and uh, isn't, isn't this a wonderful thing, he said. And I mentioned it to this man, and I said, uh, why is this a wonderful thing? And he responded, we are becoming a normal city. Well, uh, when you have something that seemed really good, <laughs> why do you want to become a normal city? But that is uh, the response that I got from him. And in fact, that term normal uh, is used quite a bit among the people who are currently planning Amsterdam, which has moved from having a really committed social democratic government to a government that's much uh, more conservative. Now, in Singapore, I mean, Singapore is truly an interesting case. I just spent two months there. Uh, it's a place I really knew nothing much about except the usual stereotypes we have about chewing gum, uh, which <laughs> Singaporeans are very resentful of this, by the way, because the first thing any foreigner says to them is, oh, I hear you can't chew gum in Singapore. Uh, and this is not how they really want to be characterized. Uh, but. Um, it's a place that provides actually a quite a high standard of living to 
uh, all its citizens. And I say citizens because 20% of the population uh, are non-citizens, and of that 20%, a quarter are um, expats who do very well, thank you, um, but the other uh, three quarters are mainly um, contract workers from the subcontinent uh, who uh, are pretty highly exploited and live in not very good conditions at all. Uh, and you see it very sharply. Uh, the, as soon as you get in a cab in Singapore, an, an electronic voice tells you to fasten your seatbelt. Uh, and I guess you can get fined if you don't, uh, because they, they care about such things in Singapore. But you see all over the place these open flatbed trucks uh, with uh, migrant, with the contract workers sitting in the back. They don't, never mind seat belts, they don't have seats. Uh, and somehow that just doesn't matter. Uh, so um, there certainly is inequity, and the inequity is directed primarily at, uh, at non-citizens. Uh, in Singapore, the state acquired virtually all the land uh, uh, in the municipal, well, the state, because it's a city state. And it did so with very low compensation uh, to owners. Uh, the structures on them were primarily one-story, two-story, three-story structures. Uh, almost all of them were demolished. Conservation districts are relatively recent in Singapore. Uh, they have uh, renovated a lot of shop houses. Uh, primarily for the benefit of tourists. Nobody actually lives above the shop anymore. Uh, whether people liked where they were living or not, I mean, this is not a, a strongly democratic society. They were simply swept away. Uh, but uh, you didn't hear, there certainly was labor strife in Singapore, uh, but there really wasn't strife over uh, displacement of housing, primarily because everybody got public housing. Uh, so the principal developer of housing in Singapore is the Housing Development Board, or HDB, and people will just say, I live in HDB. The quality of HDB housing is quite high, especially what's been built more recently. Uh, so 82% of the population, of the citizen population, that is, lives in public housing. Uh, and more than 95% of these own their own units. Uh, so it's a hybrid system in this sense. You can resell your unit on the private market at whatever price uh, the market will bear. And right now people are making fairly substantial profits uh, on the houses that they bought. Uh, they pay for the houses out of money. There's a forced savings system in Singapore uh, and uh, they pay for the housing out of their savings, but uh, the interest rate is very low, and the lender is the government. But interestingly, although you own your own apartment, the control of the buildings rests with the HDB, which has a whole lot of rules. For example, you cannot move into an HDB apartment unless you are part of a family. That is, you have to be married. Uh, you. Uh, can only resell uh, to people of the right ethnic group because every building is supposed to have an ethnic balance proportionate to the population of, the, uh, of Singapore as a whole. Uh, so every building has to have something like 80% Chinese and 12% Malay and 7% Indian. Uh, so uh, ownership is limited. That is what we mean by ownership. Uh, you can get money back for selling your building, but you don't have all the rights uh, that an owner normally has. HDB reinvests uh, the proceeds that it gets from renting housing uh, in its stock, and uh, in addition, the government uh, covers its deficits. Uh, so cumulatively, uh, this has added up to about 16 billion US dollars, which on a and we're talking about a population of only 5 million, uh, so that on a cumulative basis, this is equivalent to if the United States had spent $800 billion on uh, public housing. Uh, they are very committed to keeping this housing, um, keeping most people in HDB housing. Uh, because there is a sort of housing bubble at the moment, 
uh, and the resale prices are high, they're building a lot more in order to bring down the price, rather than doing what Amsterdam's doing of moving more and more, to, or what almost every other place is doing of moving towards privatization, they're doing just the opposite. Now this is a quote from Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father of Singapore, who said, I saw no reason why private landowners should profit from an increase in land value brought about by economic development and the infrastructure paid for with public funds. Well, that could be a quote from Henry George. Uh, so here you have this man who came out of a socialist labor background, who made Singapore into one of the economic powers of the capitalist world. Uh, but who still has certain principles that I guess you would call socialist. Uh, the outcomes then for Singapore are that the HDB retains possession of the buildings and enforces these regulations I mentioned upon them. Uh, it continues, uh, it has raised the income ceiling uh, for people allowed to move into social housing or public housing so that the great majority of the population will continue to live in it. Uh, there is no real estate speculation. There can't be because of public ownership of the land. And as in Amsterdam, uh, desirable residences are spread throughout the city. Uh, there are no slums, and there, there are parts which are single-family expensive houses, uh, but for the most part, um, uh, the, um, each neighborhood is really quite mixed income. Uh, every new neighborhood uh, has ample community facilities movie theaters, community centers, swimming pools, recreation centers, uh, markets uh, that sell uh, low end and shopping malls that sell high end. Uh, it's, um, there's really a lot of communal space. There is a right to the city there. Uh, what's, uh, for those of us who teach planning theory, one of the things that's truly interesting about Singapore is it combines um, Ebenezer Howard's Garden City with Le Corbusier's Radiant City. Uh, Jane Jacobs very sarcastically refers to uh, Radiant Garden City, meaning that uh, this is not a good thing to have. But in fact, it works pretty well uh, in Singapore, which likes to call itself the city within a garden. Uh, so in its uh, current situation, uh, Singapore, unlike Amsterdam, is retaining the goal of uh, keeping most of the population in public housing. Uh, the newest public housing buildings are indistinguishable from high-end private condominiums. Uh, it uh, captures the land value increases. Uh, and as I said, it's responding to recent inflation in resale prices by greatly increasing housing production. Now there you see in back those high rises are called the pinnacle. It's the most recent public housing, and their, and their recent public housing is all done by high-end architects and is made to be quite fancy. Uh, in front is a conservation district of restored shop houses. Uh, sort of in the intermediate back is more, um, is, is uh, public housing that was built in an earlier stage. Uh, so what you see is an increase in architectural values, uh, and uh, people want to live in it. Uh, people are very happy, in fact, to live in HDB housing. Uh, one of the things that was commented on uh, is that uh, initially people were fearful of living in a high floor, thought the elevators wouldn't work, uh, that they'd have to climb up, but that now everybody wants to live on a high floor with a view. And so what you had was a transformation of uh, the desires of the population, really. Uh, and one of the things I became quite aware of teaching there and asking my students uh, what they thought was the most desirable kind of housing is one group said, oh yes, a single family detached house. The Australians certainly thought that. Uh, but the Indians in the class all thought that high rise was best and the higher up in the high rise you were, the better off you were. So, so much of this is a matter of what kind of taste we're socialized into. Uh, now I'm going to, since I really want to finish, uh, I'll just briefly mention the kinds of other ways uh, which people will be talking about in many of the subsequent papers uh, that uh, value from land, from increases uh, in land values is captured by the public. Uh, 
Uh, community land trusts really do the same thing as public ownership, except that uh, it's a nonprofit that owns the land rather than uh, the municipality. And it does protect that land from the kinds of uh, pendulum swings that you see in, you know, that we saw in uh, the UK and that we see in Amsterdam, where uh, suddenly we have privatization uh, as we have a different uh, group in power. Uh, Public-private partnerships may require profit sharing, which is the case in New York in 42nd Street and Battery Park City. But uh, although the money may go to the municipality, there's no guarantee uh, that it will further equity. And in fact, what's happened uh, to this money in New York is that uh, they find uh, they use it as a sort of revenue source for stuff they can't otherwise finance. Uh, most recently, the expansion of the Javits Convention Center. Uh, so the money from Battery Park City, which was supposed to be used to finance low-income housing, is not being used for that purpose. Uh, so here's a picture of Battery Park City. The initial apartment buildings were uh, rent stabilized, but have now moved out of stabilization. The World Financial Center, of course, is a very major source of revenue. Uh, other approaches, uh, linkage fees, uh, which Boston has used, uh, which do have an equity effect if they're used for housing, uh, for low-income housing, but uh, obviously do not have the effect of restricting speculation. Uh, TIFs, which normally only go to um, improve the area from which they're drawn, uh, but uh, I studied for a period um, the use of TIF in the um, Minneapolis uh, neighborhood revitalization program where the money was actually redistributed from downtown uh, to the neighborhoods. Downtown was the TIF district. Uh, it went to the neighborhoods and the neighborhoods that were poorest got uh, substantially more than the rest. Uh, so that's in fact the only case I know of where TIF has been used for equity purposes, but it potentially could be. Uh, Laura Wolf Powers is going to talk about community benefits agreements. Now such agreements need not be uh, producing greater equity, uh, but typically they do involve surrounding low-income neighborhoods to a development. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, yes. the property tax is obviously the most common method of uh, retrieving value increases, uh, but the property tax is not necessarily equitable and it's not necessarily redistributive. Uh, the equity problem with the property tax, of course, is that you are a homeowner uh, living in a place that you bought for a modest amount. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, it suddenly acquires locational advantages and the value goes way up, but your income may not have gone up at all. And so this is a typical equity problem with the property tax. Uh, the most uh, equitable method would be uh, having public ownership of land and structures, the Amsterdam model, uh, with the rent burden determined by income. Uh, now what Amsterdam does is it charges a rent based on the cost of the building, but if your income, if it surpasses a certain percentage of your income, uh, you get a rent subsidy automatically. It isn't as in the United States where the amount of rent subsidy is appropriated each year. Uh, in both Amsterdam and Singapore, public land ownership uh, prevents speculative development uh, and it flattens the bid rent curve. Uh, so equity uh, becomes substituted for a narrowly defined market efficiency in land markets. Uh, the other means of confiscating land value uh, require uh, essentially that private developers make a reward uh, in order to enter into the deals whereby they would uh, provide a share of the profits uh, to uh, the public sector. Uh, so that uh, if your concern is in fact equity rather than simply municipal finance, uh, then uh, you have to go much further uh, than simply capturing uh, land value increases. So thank you. We have uh, some time for uh, questions and comments, uh, which Susan, I believe, agrees to uh, Absolutely. deal with. 
you started by making a distinction between private and public ownership, but then as you proceeded, it became clear that it's really a continuum. What really is private ownership? Is land his own fee simple but heavily conscribed by planning? Is that really private ownership? Or if it's a, a, a leasehold, um, is that where an owner has the use of land um, that's still owned by the government, is that really private ownership? Uh, the, the Singapore example is interesting um, because you have a government that's been growing at 10% a year. And then you talk about the political imperative in, in, in Amsterdam and the UK going more toward privatization. But one could argue it's driven by the, the fiscal crisis that Western governments are facing. They don't have the, the revenue that Singapore has to continue to invest. So in order to get the private sector to make the infrastructure development and, and the necessary development to make these projects work, you have to move toward in, on that continuum toward private ownership. So how do you deal with that? Well, I'm not sure that the reason that Amsterdam is moving toward privatization and, quote, normality is because of a fiscal crisis. Uh, because they didn't really have a fiscal crisis and they've been, uh, for the last uh, decade, their economy, or two decades even, their economy has been doing quite well. Uh, now, it is the case that they try to entice uh, private or try to make deals with private developers so that they will put in infrastructure and that's particularly the case in Amsterdam Suidas uh, where uh, this was the this is the major new business center of Amsterdam and they have a sort of situation like uh, uh, the Southeast Expressway in Boston where they want to bury a road in a railroad this is very expensive and so they would like uh, the private developers to pay for it in return for getting the land that's, uh, or getting to use the land that's being created. Uh, but when you take the areas like uh, the Western Garden suburbs, which are being privatized, uh, it's, not being, it's not happening because of fiscal pressure. It's happening because uh, they ideologically think that there should be more private ownership, and particularly politically, uh, as Amsterdam became much more affluent, uh, there was a demand on the part of upper middle class people uh, to own their own property. And in particular, not to have to be on the housing waiting lists uh, so that they could, in the words of, of one uh, scholar there, use this word remark, they could, quote, jump the queue. Uh, so the reason, the, there certainly is political pressure for it, but the reasons are not because uh, uh, at least in the residential areas, uh, because of fiscal problems. The reason really has to do uh, with um, uh, the fact that there is a housing shortage. Everybody wants, many people want to live in Amsterdam. Uh, and if you move to a market system, the people who are well, more well-to-do will have a much better chance of living there when, uh, rather than saying that 90% of the people have to live in public housing. what you mean by equity, because um, it seems to me some of your examples may not um, hold. For example, the person who owned the house, the value of the house went up, that person had a better asset than that person had before. Or Battery Park City, uh, the funding from that uh, supported the mayor's 10-year housing program in New York City, which then gave better housing for immigrants in the city. So how is it that you're defining equity? Well, to begin with, I'm going to factually disagree with you on the 10-year housing plan because although the first uh, infusion of funds from Battery Park City were used to finance something less than $400 million worth of housing revenue bonds, uh, it never went to housing again. Uh, so that uh, it became sort of loose money that the, the mayors could play with and they've used it for lots of different purposes and because it wasn't in the, reg the tax raised budget, uh, they had particular leeway in terms of how they would use their money. Uh, the person who uh, is affected by the property tax, I'm not quite sure I understood the point you were making. Right, the person gains an asset as long as they sell it but they are forced out of their house. So the question in terms of equity uh, then becomes one of um, you want to keep living where you're living for a variety of reasons, 
uh, but you're forced out because of the increase on property tax. On the other hand, you're 70 years old and you really always wanted to move to Florida anyhow. Uh, so, so there's a kind of question there. Uh, I just uh, read a senior thesis at Harvard on, um, um, why is my mind blank, Santa Fe, uh, in which um, she talks about uh, the American dream of home ownership and how the gentrifiers who moved in, their dream was this adobe house in Santa Fe, while the dream of the occupants of this adobe house, which cost an enormous amount to keep up, their dream was to get out of there and into a new suburban bi-level, so in fact, both were happy. Uh, so it depends. Uh, My definition of equity is that uh, people, regardless of their income, uh, should in fact have a right to the city, meaning a place to live in the city that provides them with substantial amenities and that their burden, their housing burden, their rent burden or ownership burden uh, shouldn't exceed, let's say, 30% of their income. Uh, that I don't think that at the city level, the municipal level, that you can have massive income redistribution, but that you can provide equal access to public transit, to public amenities, and to decent housing. It's a very interesting idea. Um, in the U.S. Con um, context, and say the Philadelphia context, where there are, you have a couple of hundred suburban jurisdictions that are competing with a large urban jurisdiction, jurisdiction, um, and many of those suburban jurisdictions are competing specifically to cater to a homogeneous, high-end group of um, households. Um, how, do you, how do you sort of bring sort of the, the multi-jurisdictional aspect in, into uh, dealing with this issue of redistribution at, at the city level? Well, uh, this was done for a while, anyhow, in the Twin Cities under the Metropolitan Council and that they did force fair share onto um, various municipalities, or New Jersey has fair share, Massachusetts has 40B. Uh, so to some extent, uh, uh, the state is requiring municipalities uh, to be more equitable, but uh, from what I've heard about the Twin Cities, uh, the effort on the part of the metropolitan government has pretty much lapsed. Uh, 40B and New Jersey, and Henry Coleman can speak much better to New Jersey than I, uh, sort of go on and they produce at the margins anyhow uh, some greater amount of equity. But that uh, po American politics is very difficult and it's very difficult to achieve equitable outcomes uh, as we well know uh, in this country. Uh, there. I'm taking one from each side here. Is this try trying to promote a particular kind of spatial equity here? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what's a nice this perspective? This, uh, I want to comment a little bit. It is from a European perspective. Um, it, it, it's very strange this nowadays, this that especially this all those countries this with a high um, social system or moving to the right, and even to the extreme right. And that's happening in the Netherlands as well. So they move away from diversity, they move away from tolerance, they move away um, from uh, planning this even this in, in the Netherlands. And they move away this from un, what they call uncontrolled equity. Um, and in the Netherlands, this, and specifically this in Amsterdam, with all the planning traditions that they had, they were not able to control the, the development in the South, this the South Axe, because it was taken this by private firms, the big banks, uh, big international companies, this, and, this, and the city, although they owned 90% of the land, just followed this over mm -hmm. there. So what's your comment that is on this? <laughs> yeah, well, I have to tell you, when I was in Amsterdam a couple of months ago, I felt disappointed <laughs> that uh, the first time I went to Amsterdam was in the 1970s when I had a student at Rutgers who came from there and I was looking uh, to find places to compare New York with where I could say 
this is a place that's capitalist but does things right. And he said, go to Amsterdam. And, I, and for years I've written about Amsterdam as being the example of the just city, or the closest thing we've got to the just city in the West. Uh, the move by Amsterdam toward neoliberalism and away from uh, its social democratic uh, concerns uh, is one that's driven by a rather nasty politics of, of ethnic uh, exclusion. Uh, and it's not, see, it's really not fiscal crisis that's doing it. It's really ideology, it's really um, uh, sort of the effect of, of, um, of volatility, of insecurity, of um, all these uh, factors which make American politics at the moment also uh, so, uh, so difficult. Uh, and that uh, one can't look at it from the perspective of saying, oh, well, what's the most economically efficient? Uh, and in fact, one of the things that happened in the South where the big banks moved in is those, one of those, you know, the biggest bank is in semi-receivership. So it isn't as if they're so um, stable or efficient or better than government at doing things either. Uh, but uh, uh, neoliberalism holds sway and it holds sway in Europe, uh, perhaps to a lesser extent than here, but it's, it's a very significant factor that's caused the move away from equity. This is why Singapore is so interesting because at the one hand it's so capitalist, but on the other hand it's so non-capitalist. And uh, it's simply accepted that it's the responsibility of the government uh, to um, make things, to provide a decent urban environment. It seems to me the big problem that, that comes up is the nature of the public sector, uh, which, as we were talking about historically, is entangled, entwined, or defined by private interests uh, at various levels, whether they be hospitals, universities, or large corporations. So, uh, and to get to the just city, do we need a semi-dictator, as you have in Singapore, <laughs> who is a just despot, or <laughs> is there another way? I know that's a tough question. Yeah, well, uh, transformation comes out, transformation of the public sector is a consequence of social movements uh, that press on the public sector. Uh, so that after World War II, uh, the power of uh, labor unions, of social democratic movements was much greater than now. Uh, one can't mourn the end of the Soviet empire, but the Soviet empire was a critical factor uh, in making the West more concerned with equity because they had to compete, because the West had to show that even under capitalism, uh, we could uh, deal with issues of inequality. Uh, but now uh, we don't have to show it to anyone. There's no competing um, force out there. And so the political system is such that uh, uh, it says that, well, what's normal is profit seeking. Uh, and that uh, when this fellow said to me, Amsterdam has to be normal, what he meant was normal was uh, screwing your neighbor if possible. Uh, and that, un and, but it's very hard to predict when social movements will come along. Uh, my first book was called Urban Political Movements, and what was striking is until uh, the Civil Rights Movement, nobody predicted it was going to happen until it happened sort of overnight, uh, or the anti-war movement. Uh, nobody thought the French Revolution was going to happen until the Estates General were called, so that um, without a social movement, we're not going to have transformation of government. Uh, but I'm not going to say, oh, well, we don't see anything but the Tea Party out there, and so we're not going to get anything. I just, not, I don't know. According to you, the definition of uh, equity, uh, just uh, given by you, I would easily imagine that the, uh, the population of New York will explode uh, because uh, no matter what income, uh, what you know, human capital, skill, efficiency, some of the residents have, they will have you know, decent housing. Uh, so, um, you know, equity definition given by you is wonderful, but uh, in reality it is very difficult to, so you need to uh, regulate, you need to have discrimination against certain group, certain income, uh, in order to bring out 
your equity. So my question is, say, in the reality, how to regulate New York population from being exploded? How do you regulate it from? Because, you know, in economic theory, you, need, you have like price discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before you can generate high income and to, to pay the high rental in New York, before you can become, become a citizen of New York. But in your world, uh, it is not this well. You, you have like regulation you know, mm -hmm. to, to you know, rent you controlling or the distribution of uh, housing more equally among citizens. So in this case, you know, the population of city uh, like New York can explode. So how to reach this, you know, reconcile well, I don't, I don't think New York has a population problem as compared to the western states, cities in the western states. Uh, but um, well, I mean, what you're really asking is what happens when demand uh, presses against supply and if you don't have a price regulation, uh, or if you have a price regulation, then, then it creates uh, problems. Uh, well, and this is the problem that Amsterdam had because there was insufficient supply uh, and demand exceeded the amount of uh, social housing that existed, there became this enormous pressure for letting the private market do the rationing. But you're getting rationing regardless. You're getting rationing either because of price, most people can't afford to buy someplace, or you're getting rationing because the government says you have to be on a wait list. Uh, and until you move up the wait list, you're not going to get a house. Uh, but uh, why one should think that it's more fair uh, to have rationing by the market uh, than rationing by uh, the government uh, is simply a question of how you, uh, well, it's a moral question, I guess I would say. Uh, one of the things I was struck by last night in Richard's really very excellent, I thought, interesting talk, but was when Hong raised the question, well, what about redistribution, and he said, well, all I can think about is economic development. I don't have time to think about distribution. Well, one of the reasons I wrote my book was because you hang out with development planners, and the only thing they're concerned about is economic development. Uh, well, economic development alone does not produce a decent society. A uh, decent society requires much greater equity, certainly, than we have in the United States. Uh, and the idea of, well, we'll produce the revenue and then you've got the revenue so then you can distribute it is, is pure wishful thinking. That does not, in fact, uh, happen. And the argument that says, well, we have a fiscal crisis so that we have to have more revenue and then once we have more revenue that somehow everybody will benefit is one that, uh, that there's nothing to demonstrate is, in fact, the case. It's a abstract case or a theoretical one, but in fact, uh, as we see very clearly in the United States, uh, in terms of the effort to tax the highest earners in this country, uh, the highest earners, of course, enormously resist paying more taxes. And they have much better access to politics. Some of the long-standing questions in applying roles uh, involve um, uh, what's the domain and what are the counterfactuals. So uh, if we take uh, sort of current people in the city and we design things uh, so that the, the least well-off user uh, is made better off, there's no guarantee that that won't make people who might want to move to the city from rural areas or other countries less well-off. Uh, and similarly, um, the question of, well, if we did this policy or that policy, would this integrate more uh, um, uh, new people, or would it increase, uh, picking up on the last question, uh, supply more? All of these are serious empirical questions, and it doesn't seem to me that a static analysis in which you s sort of deal with counterfactuals by sort of ideological name calling and, you know, uh, people are just uh, evil and uh, want to screw their neighbor, I don't see how that really answers the basic Rawlsian question, even if you accept uh, a Rawlsian framework. <laughs> well, to begin with, I would say that, that you're uh, using some ideological terms yourself, but um, uh, I to some degree agree with Paul Peterson's book, City Limits, which is that um, when you're talking about producing equity, you really need a national government that does it. Cities aren't 
cities, by their very nature, by having limited boundaries, uh, are not able to do this in any very massive way. But they can provide a better environment for the people who live there. Uh, if you're saying that, well, if New York provides a better environment for New Yorkers, that somehow it will injure people who live in New Jersey, um, People, well, New Jersey had better do something too, I guess I would say. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that um, having a better New York is necessarily going to be worse for everybody else. What you're saying in some ways, well, it'll become so desirable for the people who live there that they won't leave and make space for other people to come, or I'm not altogether sure you know, what uh, argument you are making there. Uh, my view on planning and municipal taxation is it can be used to produce a better city uh, for the people who live there. It can't be used to deal with the overall problems of a nation. Singapore has enormous advantages in that it is a nation state, uh, which, so it can do things that a city within a nation can't do. Uh, but I can't see why making life better for the worst off in a city is somehow harmful. I wonder if there are other ways to accomplish uh, your justice goals besides keeping all the housing and all the property in government hands. I mean, I, I lived in Cambridge as a grad student and we all saw the terrible inefficiencies associated with rent controlled housing. Often trying to circumvent markets leads to not very good outcomes and a lot of corruption. So. Are there other tools that could be used to accomplish this a system of subsidies to low-income people so they could afford whatever the rents are? Um, the problem, you know, rationing, it, it, the problem in Amsterdam isn't surely just rationing by being on a waiting list. You also don't have efficient incentives for increasing the supply if there's excess demand. You know, markets are good at some things. So I wonder if you've contemplated other approaches to dealing with justice besides uh, keeping all the land in government hands? Uh, well, I think there are other approaches. And by the way, Cambridge is pretty good about building social housing uh, and builds a couple of hundred units uh, every year. Uh, rent control is problematic because it does, it, it lowers investment uh, in renovation, that kind of thing. Uh, but it didn't prevent people from building in Cambridge. They did build the whole time there was rent control. Once they eliminated rent control in Cambridge, of course, it caused an enormous impact on low-income people who were renters who moved out, were forced out by the increase in rent control. Uh, I think you need a housing uh, uh, that is a demand-side subsidy as well as a supply-side subsidy, certainly. Uh, but if you have public land ownership, uh, the kinds of issues that uh, arose when you had private ownership in Cambridge and uh, rent control uh, are, are substantially lessened. Uh, in New York, which still, of course, has rent regulation, uh, it may, in fact, have produced inefficiencies, but on the other hand, uh, it also kept the middle class in New York. Uh, if, I would argue that if New York hadn't had rent regulation, uh, that we would be seeing a different and much less, in fact, prosperous New York now uh, than, uh, than we have, uh, because you would have seen uh, the phenomenon of, say, Philadelphia to a much greater extent. That is simply uh, the out-migration of all the middle-class people who you might say, well, they're middle-class, why do they deserve to live and, regulate and get a regulated rent? And certainly I know people who abuse it, but it kept them there. Uh, and so there are advantages to having a regulated housing market uh, despite uh, the kinds of problems, which you're quite right. Uh, it does cause in terms of key money being passed, in terms of, uh, of uh, people who uh, once it was a family and now it's a single person living in a seven-room Central Park West apartment. Uh, is, you know, these are all issues, but uh, it doesn't mean that rationing by the private market is better. Susan, you, you mentioned that if you expanded, I think it was a Singapore subsidy that was cumulative over a number of years, it would, uh, it would be something like $800 billion. 
in U.S. terms. And I think it's wonderful to make these kinds of, of translations. But it made me think that there is a U.S. housing policy that distributes roughly $100 billion a year or more. There are people in the room who know better than I exactly how to estimate those numbers. Could you comment on that? The, the $800 billion is sort of has a shock value. A reporter might remember it, mm -hmm. print it tomorrow. Um, would there be other things to contrast that with? I, when you the say United the hundred States? billion a year, are you talking about for for, mortgage in, for the mortgage, mortgage interest subsidy, tax sure. deduction? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah There's yeah. also a tax subsidy. Sure. And it adds up. Uh, that that I believe yeah. oh, is a trillion oh, yeah. dollars a decade or more. Yeah. Oh, we heavily subsidize owner-occupied housing. There's no question of that. What we don't heavily subsidize is publicly owned housing, which is what, in fact, Singapore does subsidize extremely heavily. Uh, so um, uh, that's an important contrast, indeed, between a country which subsidizes the well-to-do and a country that subsidizes those people who are less well to do. Okay. Thank you very much, Susan.